Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil mursalin wa ala ahli wa sabi ajma'in. Allahumma innaka khalakul azim, innaka sami'un alim, innaka ghafurur rahim, innaka rabbul arshil azim, innaka barul jawadul karim. Rabbana alaika tawakkalna wa ilaikal anabna wa ilaikal masir. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah wa fil ahiratil hasanah tawakina azabanna. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Zuhilmi. A warm welcome to our official Associate Professor Dr. Wan Zuhaini Spinti Saad, Director of Academic Excellence, Department of Higher Education, Ministry of Higher Education, Malaysia. Our consultant for the day, Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chambers, Coordinator Special and Inclusive Education and Postgraduate Research at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, Fremantle. Our moderators, Professor Dr. Fong Soon Fook, UNESCO Consultant, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, University of Malaysia, Sabah. Associate Professor Dr. Nobiha A. Shukor, Deputy Director of Center of Advancement in Digital and Flexible Learning, University of Technology, Malaysia. And our beloved workshop facilitators. Once again, on behalf of the organizer, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this first virtual workshop, Design and Development of Inclusive Open Educational Resources, IOER. For your information, the IOER policy is the first in the world which embraces the ability differences in the preparation of Open Educational Resources, OER. This policy encourages the creation of OER by considering the needs across physical and mental capabilities, gender, age, and social economic status. We have launched the policy on the 2nd of December last year and was officiated by our Honorable Minister of Higher Education. To strengthen the implementation of the IOER policy, the Department of Higher Education, in collaboration with UNESCO, holding a series of IOER design and development workshops with the participants from public universities, private universities, the Ministry of Education, and Simeo Regional Center for Special Educational Needs. Now, to officially launch the workshop, we would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Wan Zuhani Spinti Saad, Director of Academic Excellence, Department of Higher Education, to lead, deliver her speech. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chong, Sinwei. Can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning um, to all. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chambers, our consultant uh, from uh, University of uh, Notre Dame, Australia. Associate Professor... Uh, Professor Dr. Fong Soon Fook um, and uh, as UNESCO consultant uh, from uh, University of Malaysia Sabah, Associate Professor Dr. Nobi Hashuko um, from, uh, as our moderator from uh, University of Technology uh, Malaysia, also our uh, chair for uh, MEPTA, uh, facilitators and participants of the uh, virtual workshop on design and development of uh, inclusive open educational resources, IOER. Uh, good morning to all and welcome uh, to this first virtual workshop. Uh, I'm, de I'm delighted um, to be here with uh, all of you today. Um, before we start on the workshop, uh, allow me to begin by sharing with you the background which led to the development of the IOER policy. Um, ever since the UNESCO's uh, 40th General Conference in November 2019 has adopted the UNESCO OER recommendation, uh, Malaysia has started the journey um, in developing an inclusive OER policy that involves content, uh, activities and resources uh, that fit and can be adapted to everyone's um, unique needs uh, with, with no or minimal barriers. So throughout the years, Malaysia has undergone a collaborative process 
with some uh, significant stakeholders and core experts in the field of OER, along with a key support through a UNESCO um, by the Director of eLearning Centre in designing this uh, inclusive education policy. So numerous workshops, meetings and, and consultations were held um, with the global uh, um, uh, uh, involvement and also in order for uh, the goal is to provide an equal education opportunity to all learners, including those who have been marginalized in many educational settings. Uh, such as uh, students from low-income communities and minorities, learners with disabilities, uh, diverse cultures and, and backgrounds, as well as learners in rural areas. So the IOER policy is the first in the world which encompasses the ability um, differences in preparation of open educational resources. So this policy uh, encourages the creation of OER by considering the needs across physical and mental capabilities, um, socioeconomic status, gender, and age. Um, as mentioned by um, our uh, MC just now, we have launched the policy on the 2nd of December this um, last year. And this event was, um, was uh, launched or officiated by our Honorable Minister of Higher Education. Now, um, as a next step, we would like to take further the policy to be adapted and implemented by other countries. So the policy has been submitted to uh, UNESCO via our Malaysia National Commission for UNESCO, um, which has been the, the letter to UNESCO, which has been signed by our um, Honorable Ministry, Minister of Higher Education. Now, um, so this is through this workshop, uh, we want to provide, we want to prepare um, the IOER uh, for an inclusive learning experience involves contents, activities, um, and uh, this uh, national uh, IOER policy is expected to provide the direction uh, in the design, development, and use of inclusive uh, open educational resources. And the most important thing is also to increase uh, success uh, and also um, access to the support of the quality learning and teaching for all learners uh, in uh, Malaysian institutions and also other organizations that, uh, that can use this uh, IUR. Uh, under the Creative Commons license, of course. So today we have about um, 85 participants from various universities, uh, public uh, or private universities. We have uh, participants from Simio Sen, a regional center for special needs. Thank you for being with us. And also, of course, the Ministry of Education. And uh, with 11 facilitators to run the workshop. Uh, and of course, uh, our moderators with uh, Prof Fong and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nobiha. So I want to take this uh, opportunity uh, to thank Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chambers for her time to be with us, to guide us in the design and development of IOER in Malaysia. Um, it is a great opportunity for us to learn together with Dr. Diane. And it is also a very crucial that I would like to, to emphasize here, it is crucial for each and every participant to give full commitment in the workshops and development of the IOER for your institutions. As you are the representatives of other um, educators who did not have the opportunity to be part of these workshops. So your roles and uh, your role and responsibilities are important um, to ensure the establishment of the IOER in Malaysia. Um, I would like to take this opportunity again to express my gratitude uh, to everyone that will contribute to the development of IOER. Um, together, we can make the vision of uh, an inclusive education a reality in Malaysia. Uh, on that note, I hereby officiate the 
the design and development of IOER Virtual Workshop 2022. Thank you to all of you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Doctor. Next, I would like to hand over the workshop to our moderator, Professor Dr. Fong Sun Fook, to give an overview of the workshop together with Associate Professor Dr. Norbi Hashukor. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just a minute. Okay, dear colleagues, good morning, selamat sejahtera, and a very warm welcome. A very good morning to our Dr. Wan Johannes, the director, and especially to Dr. Diane Chamber, our consultant trainer. Uh, my name is Fong from University of Malaysia Sabah, and together with Associate Professor Dr. Nurbiha uh, Sukor, who is the president of MEPTA from UTM, We'll be moderating this uh, virtual workshop. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are a total of 81 participants from 20 public universities, selected private universities, Ministry of Education, Simulsen. Welcome and congratulations on your appointment by your respective TNCAA and director. And as Dr. Wan Johannes mentioned, we hope that uh, your presence here is also it comes along together with your commitment. Okay. Uh, that we will make a success out of this uh, workshop. We are also very uh, honored to have our highly esteemed UNESCO consultant, Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chamber from Notre Dame uh, University, Perth, Australia. Uh, welcome Dr. Diane and a big thank you. Uh, and Dr. Diane will be introducing herself later on. So I'll not be reading her bio data. Our 11 facilitators, uh, headed by Dr. Chong Chao Ming and team, uh, who are experienced practitioners of Universal Design for Learning, UDL, from UPM as well as UPC, and they will be supporting us in our respective groups uh, throughout the project. So welcome and thank you. Uh, all of us will be meeting our facilitators in the backup room later on. In the course of these uh, next four months, uh, Dr. Diane Chamber will lead us in a journey exploring the world of open distance education, which might be new to many of us, designing and developing inclusive and accessible open education resources, which again, might also be quite new to many of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Wan Johannes, uh, in 2019, uh, in the 40th uh, Gender Conference of uh, UNESCO, the UNESCO recommendation of OER was adopted. And what is important is that uh, all the member states, uh, when Malaysia is one of them, agree to undertake action in five areas. So, I just briefly mentioned okay, uh, the five areas. And today, the Ministry of Higher Education under uh, BKA, under the leadership of the Pangara, Dr. Wanjo Hainis, uh, is responding to the call of UNESCO. And that is uh, number one, the call to take action to build capacity, building of capacity of our stakeholders to create, to access, to reuse, to adapt and redistribute uh, OER. So this is what the virtual workshop is all about. Developing supportive policy for OER, uh, which has been mentioned, already been established and even launched uh, in December. And as has been mentioned, uh, UNESCO proudly has declared to all the other nations that Malaysia has taken the lead. So we are taking the lead. So whatever you're doing uh, is sent out as a model for the, for the world, in fact. So for this, we say a big thank you to our Dr. Wan Johannes, who has been a very strong, bold, aggressive leader in uh, taking us through. 
encouraging inclusive and equitable quality OER. So again, okay, this is what we are here for, building, encouraging inclusive quality OER that is also equitable. Uh, nurturing the creation of sustainability uh, models of OER and to promote and reinforce international cooperation in OER. So right now, for example, uh, our virtual workshop is a collaboration together with UNESCO Paris, as well as we have an uh, international consultant, and that is uh, Dr. Diane Chamber. And there, Dr. Diane Chamber will also be bringing in some guest speakers who are world-renowned, okay? Uh, later on, she will introduce them to us. So we are very fortunate. So dear colleagues, this project consists of uh, three phases. Okay, so from today until the end of June, tentatively until the 28th of June. Okay, uh, there are three phases. Phase one, a series of uh, virtual workshop plus activities. And this is what we're doing now, our first webinar series. Okay, first one. After that, on the 11th, the 14th, the 18th, the 23rd, and in fact, uh, there's another one uh, on the 23rd. So there are other five actually, okay? Where Google Malaysia also will be coming in to support us. The phase two, uh, so after this uh, series of our webinar, then we we'll go into phase two. The phase two is where every one of us in our respective institution will design and develop your IOER, okay? And in the phase three, uh, we were at the end of you know, June, somewhere in 28th of June, probably, there will be an international seminar and an exhibition of our IOER outcome. Each and every one of you, your IOER will be displayed not only to Malaysian, okay? Not only to the region, but to the world, okay? Through the network of UNESCO. So, I congratulate all of you, okay, for coming on to this uh, international platform. And I am more than confident that under the leading of Dr. Diane Chambers, uh, we will make it, okay? Again, you know, some of us will be very unfamiliar with many new language, but don't worry, uh, Dr. Diane Chambers will lead us through. Now, uh, in the course of this uh, sharing of Dr. Diane, should you have any question, uh, please share it in the chat box. And then the moderators, uh, Dr. Nobiha and myself, will attempt to raise the question at the appropriate time. Okay? Uh, dear colleagues, may all of us, with an open heart, and may we open our heart, okay, take a significant step forward to foster greater accessibility and inclusivity for all our learners, in particular, learners with disability. Together, together, dear friends, we can make this vision of inclusive education a reality in Malaysia and around the globe. I wish everyone a very productive and enjoyable virtual workshop with Dr. Diane Chambers, and with our facilitators. I shall hand over the floor to Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chambers or to our MC. Thank you. Ms. Song, yeah, over to you. All right, thank you, Prof. Long. Now we would like to invite Associate um, Professor Dr. Diane the, Chambers. Sorry, sorry, Sinwe. Yes. Uh, can, can we take a photo or group photo first before we, we kick, before we start the workshop? Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, is it okay, uh, uh, Dr. Diane? Can we take a photo first? Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Let's have everyone ready. I think I will have four screenshots over here. Let's start with the first one. Can we can we ask them to turn on the video? Okay. Yeah. With them, we will with seek them. kind cooperation from all participants to open your camera for a while, just for the photo sessions. I see familiar faces now. Okay, everyone ready? With your smile. One, two, three. Hold on a second. Hold on. 
caranya. Oke, okay. okay, second one. Let's get everybody ready. One. Second one, perempuan Sabaria. Nice one. Third one, starting. And there are a few, a few did not open the video. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Haris, um, Puan Ernie, and Puan Nur Farahida. Okay, okay, let's get ready. One, two, three. Okay, the last one will be for the group, <clears throat> starting from Mr. Anwar to Mr. No Ram, Irwan Ramli. Okay, get ready. One, two, three. Okay, I have everyone captured. Thank you very much for kind cooperation. Um, one more thing. I think um, yes, it, it would be easier if let's if you can rename yourself and uh, put your institution in front, and then put your name, so that we can you know uh, then easier for us to identify the participants. Is it okay? So just for information, you can rename yourself on the top right. There's three bullets over there. Once you click in, you can click on rename. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Now I'll pass this to Associate Professor Dr. Diane Chambles for the presentation. Good morning, everybody. It's absolutely lovely to be here. And I'm, I'm just thrilled that I can be part of this amazing um, experience. Malaysia is doing such fantastic work in this area. I can't say enough. Um, you know, it's world breaking. So thank you very much for letting me be part of that. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Um, Juan Sohanes for her fantastic introduction and her work in this area. Uh, I know she's been quite instrumental in um, getting the IOR recommendation through, as has uh, Professor Fong. So I'd like to acknowledge um, them. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to, to Professor Fong and Dr. Uh, Nubaha for being moderators today um, and to Dr. Chong for being our MC. So thank you very much. Um, Chong MC, we've got a, a number of people <laughs> uh, by that name. So, Salamat uh, Datang, Namasaya, Iala, Dr. Diane Chambers. That's that's it for my <laughs> that's it for my Malay. Sorry, uh, but I'm very very pleased to be working with you today. If I do speak too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, I, I do have a tendency to get very excited about my work and I tend to speed up. So please bear with me there. I just wanted to touch on some Zoom etiquette for today. I know this is something we all do when we're doing online and distance learning with our students. So I just wanted to, to reiterate the Zoom etiquette. Because we are on Zoom, um, it's really important to check that your tech works before you come onto the, the session. Uh, to make sure that you're not eating or, or you know people passing by in your surroundings, which can can happen, uh, that you mute your microphone when when you're not speaking. So that's really critical. And if you can use headphones, they make your um, voice clearer. Uh, make sure that you do stay focused and pay attention. Particularly, I think this is work. This workshop is so critical um, to make sure that that everybody is participating is really important. And you, when you're posting in the chat, make sure you're posting relevant questions. But if you don't know the answer to a question, then it's relevant. OK, so please don't think that it's a silly question or um, people are going to think terrible things of you. If you've got a question, please post it. Um, I can't encourage that enough. You know, most likely there will be other people who would also want to know the answer to that question. So can't, you know, please make sure you do. Just a little bit about myself. I thought it's important that you know who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, and uh, I'm initially a special education teacher. So a primary trained special ed teacher. 
And I taught students from four years of age up to 21 years of age. <clears throat> I've done so in the special education segregated setting, but I've also done um, lots of teaching in inclusive settings where students were fully included. I've been in tertiary education now for about 24 years. So I, I can associate with all of you <laughs> in regards to teaching university um, level students as well. I have a strong background in working with teachers in regards to um, inclusive education in both pre-service and in-service teacher um, settings. And I'm quite heavily involved in a number of international initiatives. So uh, with UNESCO, the Commonwealth of Learning, I do some work with them at the moment um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've just been doing some work with the Zero Project in Brazil. So there's a variety of different initiatives that run through. I have worked quite extensively with UNESCO in Bangkok, uh, where we've looked at teacher educators in Southeast Asia. Uh, in particular, I worked with a, a wide variety of people from the Philippines, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Cambodia. And we were looking at low-tech assistive technology. So I have some background in that area and in those countries. Um, I have a number of publications. We're published in, in a variety of different areas. So I do have some scholarly background in this area as well. So just wanted to make sure you knew who I was uh, before we started. So what I would like us to do now is actually test our breakout rooms. And to do that, I'm going to get you to all introduce yourselves within your breakout groups. Uh, I want you to spend a couple of minutes and introduce yourself to both your facilitator and your fellow participants. Uh, include your role, how long you've been in that role and what you do, and what you're hoping to learn from this particular series of workshops. So I'm going to send you all now to your breakout rooms. And Okay, welcome back everybody. I'm sorry about that. That was a bit of a mess, wasn't it? Uh, that happens sometimes when we're teaching online, unfortunately. So the best laid plans uh, were that everybody was already assigned, but unfortunately we had people that weren't and people that for some reason were in the wrong group. So I will actually go out tonight and I'll make sure that everybody's correctly assigned to groups in future, okay? So hopefully you had a chance to introduce yourselves and get to know a little bit about what your roles are in your particular universities. This particular, um, session today is really around getting to know what diversity means. So we figured that that was a really important component before you move forward in, in looking at how you devise resources for diverse students. So today, uh, there are tasks at the end of each of the four training sessions that we're expecting you to complete. And they're really for your learning, they're to enhance your understanding of the content that has previously been covered. Uh, the final task, so in uh, end of June, as, as discussed by uh, Professor Fong, is that we're going to get you to develop your own inclusive, open educational resource. So if it could be in your field, it might be in your particular area, uh, it could be something that's very general or versatile that's able to be used. But as we work through the components and understanding of what inclusive OER is, be thinking about how you're going to link that to your own work. Okay. So we will have a celebration of all the work that you guys will do, which is quite exciting. And we're hoping to upload the um, inclusive open education resources that you develop to a common repository so that they can be available for everybody in Malaysia and around the world to use. So you'll all be famous. Okay, uh, we've got 11 facilitators and I, I thank the facilitators very much. They will be supporting us in our journey and they will be working with us in our breakout groups as well. So the facilitators are very highly skilled in the area of universal design for learning and universal design for learning is one of the core concepts that's going to underpin what we do over the next four workshops. So the learning outcome for this particular session today is to increase the knowledge and understanding of diversity within our classrooms. And sometimes lecturers or, or workers at a, a tertiary level think that they don't have a very wide diversity, maybe you know, religion diversity, maybe um, uh, ethnic diversity, 
but you would be surprised at how diverse your students actually are in a university classroom. Uh, I have a student who is deaf at the moment in my teaching and I have to wear a microphone uh, when she's in my classroom. I've had students in wheelchairs at a tertiary level becoming teachers and I've had students who were completely deaf and completely blind uh, becoming teachers. So the diversity is quite massive. I have a lot of students in my classroom at the moment who have quite significant learning disabilities, uh, who actually work twice as hard as anybody else to make it through. And where I can support them, I do so. So I just wanted to start off by, by looking at inclusivity. Uh, this is a really key concept that's often used and, and thrown around, but not necessarily very clearly understood. And I think um, Juan Sohanas explained it very well when she talked about the variety of people. Uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, sayings from him, quotations, says that inclusive good quality education is a foundation for dynamic and equitable societies. Uh, I must say, I find that the Malaysian society is extremely dynamic. Um, I'm really enjoying working with people who are so passionate about education. And I'm hoping that we will work towards more equitable societies around the world. And so this, this statement very much resonates with me. One thing that I, I wanted to point out, and these are the statistics from Malaysia. So this is from the Bureau of Statistics in Malaysia, is just to look at the diversity across populations. So in particular with this graphic, uh, we've got you know, a range of um, educational levels, a range of literacy levels, different living conditions. Uh, we've got different populations. Um, the majority of people in Malaysia are um, citizens, which is, is fantastic but there's 2.7 million people who are not citizens. Um, so it's, it's considering all of the variety uh, that our society brings. Aging, you know, are we getting older as a society? Is that a uh, thing to consider as well? I had a 70 year old PhD student the other day. So are we considering those aspects in our um, educational provision as well? Um, Another thing here is socioeconomic status. So how much money people have, all of those things can actually impact quite significantly on our ability to study. I'm just gonna show you a very brief video. Hopefully this works. Um, it's, I, I must preface this by saying it's actually done by a travel person and uh, there are some odd bits in it, but please uh, bear with me because I think it really does represent the diversity in Malaysia. Multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious countries in the world. And I'm thrilled to be back. Love it. I'm Chindian and I'm Malaysian. I'm a Thai Malay Malaysian. I'm a Malay, Mama, Chinese, and a Malaysian. We are Chinese. Chinese. I'm Malay and Indian. I'm a Chinese but culturally Filipino. Out of the 32 million people living in this nation, only about half of them can call themselves ethnic Malays. 23% or 8 million people are ethnic Chinese. 7% are ethnic Indians. And the rest of them are just confused. Malaysia's official religion is Islam, attracting 61% of the population. In fact, ethnic Malays are required to be Muslim by law. The next biggest religion is Buddhism at 20%, then Christianity at 10%, and Hinduism at 6%. This incredible diversity of Malaysia's people is reflected in its cuisine, language, and economy. When looking at its food, Malaysia truly has one of the world's best. My name is Ahmad, and my favorite thing about KL is the food. A fusion of indigenous Malay, Chinese, Indonesian, and Indian with lighter touches of Dutch and British, its former rulers for 200 plus years. My favorite three dishes in Malaysia are nasi lemak, laksa, and banana leaf. Let's talk about language. Most people here know at least three languages fluently. We like to speak and choose certain words. Hey, macha, you want makan here or tapau? That sentence means, do you want to eat here or take out? But it has words from four languages, Tamil, English, Malay, and Chinese. But if you are traveling to Malaysia, you won't have to worry about learning any new languages because almost everyone here speaks fluent English. Almost as good as the Philippines. I am always very, very impressed. From an economic standpoint, Point, the bustling capital of Kuala Lumpur is one of Asia's fastest growing business hubs and its skyline is dominated by the tallest twin buildings in the world. The Pajanas Tower. Do you know how tall they are? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> but once you escape the city life, you'll quickly enter a humble, relaxing, and contrasting lifestyle. That's why I'm just going to leave it there. So hopefully, I, I thought that that video really exemplified the 
wide diversity in Malaysia. Another thing too is that it, it talked about rural and urban um, differences as well. When we're looking at online and distance learning, it's really important to remember that not, not everybody comes from our uh, urban centre or from a rural centre, but there's a wide variety. So when we're looking at diversity, socioeconomic background can actually impact quite significantly. And we don't always consider that, um, particularly if we've got well-funded universities. That urban, urban and rural um, spread can make quite a, a distinct difference and students have very different ways of looking at the world when they come from different backgrounds. Um, you may have refugees in Australia in particular, we have quite a, a large refugee um, cohort and that impacts on our culture, but it also impacts on how we cater for the needs of those students. Language, and I don't know about uh, you guys, but we're finding in Australia that mental health issues, anxiety and depression are getting increasingly significant for our students at a tertiary level. So we're dealing with a lot more mental health issues and accommodating students around those can be quite interesting. And of course, we also have students with disabilities and special learning needs. Um, and sometimes when we think about diversity and inclusion, people just think about people with disabilities. So I really wanted to highlight that there are a wide range of other uh, groups that we need to consider when we're working in a diverse um, environment. Okay, so within our university classrooms, you're going to have a wide range of students as well. And it, it could be, uh, this is just a rough breakup, but um, it might be students from minority backgrounds. It could be students with learning dis disabilities or difficulties. It might be regular students who don't have any particular difficulty. Uh, it could be students who are gifted and talented who aren't necessarily catered for. And it could be students with disabilities. So a regular classroom isn't actually very regular. And if we dig down, we can find a wide variety of diversity within our classrooms. Uh, hopefully this will work. Ooh, let's try this. I'm going to uh, put a poll up for you. And uh, it's very brief, only three questions. And I want you to uh, just answer these questions to the best of your ability. Uh, I'm just, you, hopefully you can see those poll results now. Yep. Uh, so 53% of people said yes, they could. Um, they do know if their students have special needs. Interestingly, 47% don't. So once again, we, we really have to look at that. Uh, when we look at the specific needs that students might have, uh, you can see the quite a range there. We've got um, dyslexia, dyscalculia, ADHD, visual impairment, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, hearing impairments, physical disabilities, can't remember what choice eight is, and mental health disorders. So there, there's a wide variety of student needs within our classroom. So this just exemplifies that diversity that we can experience um, just among students who have special needs, let alone among students with other diverse um, issues as well. And whoop, about 72% said they'd had a discussion with students about needs in case, so that they can actually address their learning needs in the classroom. So that's very encouraging. It means that you guys are all very caring about your students and really willing to help. So that's a, an excellent way forward. Okay, moving on, come back, go away. All right, so, oh, come on, thank you. Uh, what I might do now, Dr. Fong, if that's okay, is just have a break for five minutes to let people use the restroom. All right, so hopefully most people are back. Um, let's start back now. And I'd really like to start talking about difference and diversity in open and distance learning. Open and distance learning is a really unique experience in teaching because we have to cater for not just people's academic needs and the course content, but we need to cater for their ability to access it academically as well. Uh, when we're looking at difference and diversity in open and distance learning, we will absolutely experience increasingly diverse cohorts. Um, because we can teach online, we're more likely to get people from different countries, uh, different environments enrolling into courses. Uh, in the last few decades, we do know that attitudes towards people who have diverse needs have definitely improved and have moved to much more uh, attitudes of acceptance. We do know now that education and acceptance in the community are rights for people with a disability, um, but people from other diverse backgrounds as well, including gender, age, socioeconomic status, um, all of those types of, of diverse issues that we come across. So, Inclusive education is really about 
diverse students learning together with support. And part of what we're going to be looking at over this four day workshop is how do we support those students? Um, all students should be participating in the life and work of the classroom. So it's not enough to have a student who's enrolled in your course, who's not actively participating in that course. And in order to make sure that they do actively participate, that might mean that there are different ways that we can support those students. Inclusive education is, is very much aligned with a rights-based philosophy, and that's why UNESCO have um, some really strong policies in this area. The rights-based model of education very much comes from a social justice basis. A social justice basis is where we're making society a just place for everybody. And that means if you're living in poverty, you still have the ability to access things, it, same as if you were a very rich person, for example. Uh, the em emphasis when we look at um, the rights-based model of education and inclusive education is that shift from dependence on other people to building and continuing independence and making sure that people can access things by themselves without having to have huge amounts of support to do so. Technology gives us the ability to do that. Uh, for example, and, and we'll go through some of these over the next three workshops, um, I'll give you lots of examples of specific types of technology that can enable somebody with particular disability or learning need to be independent. There's also much stronger political advocates for the rights of, of, of all people and legislation to ensure those rights, um, along with the advocacy processes that are in place to uphold the rights for those people. I just want to Sorry? No? Um, I just wanted to show you this graphic. Uh, this explains where we've moved from. So previously, uh, people with disabilities and people with, with quite diverse differences were excluded from society and from education in particular. We then moved towards um, a focus on uh, segregation, where we may be um, catered for the needs of students with disabilities, but they were in a separate school or a separate classroom well away from everybody else. We then moved towards integration, and integration was really where we had the students included in the classroom, but they weren't really a part of that classroom. Uh, they might have been situated there or placed there, but they were doing their own work. They might have had an education assistant or a support worker uh, working with them quite separately from the rest of the class. Um, that's what we call integration, not inclusion. Inclusion is where we have students who are working alongside their peers who are doing work of the same or similar variety um, within that classroom and are included in all aspects, including the social life of that particular um, classroom activity. So if there's a, a WhatsApp group that, that the class is part of, then they're part of that as well. Um, all of those things need to be considered when we're including students. So it's not just where the students can actually be um, placed in the, your particular class, but are, are they part of it? Are they actively involved? And there are huge amounts of benefits of inclusion. For the student with a particular need or for a student with adversity, it gives them a sense of belonging. And that's a really critical aspect. All of us need to feel that we belong. Um, it stimulates a, an environment for them of learning, develops friendships and enhances their self-esteem. They also actually have really good peer models and same age peers, which is incredibly important. For students without particular needs, it really helps them to develop empathy and understanding and an appreciation of uniqueness for all in their classroom. So having students with diverse abilities in your, your university classrooms actually does quite a, a lot for helping um, everybody to understand those particular needs. For educators, believe it or not, it actually enhances our skills quite significantly. So it allows us to not just appreciate diversity on our own right, but to, to be creative in regards to our problem solving abilities. Uh, you have to find ways for the students to be incorporated. So it really does allow you to build your skills and your instructional ability is enhanced as a result as well. So having students with diverse needs in our classroom is a blessing, uh, not something to be afraid of. It also supports equality. So on a community basis, we're making sure we're modelling democratic processes, promoting the rights of everybody and really growing um, the community as a whole. So inclusion is, is such a strong concept. It, it really does permeate through all aspects of society. Oh, moving on. 
So when we're promoting acceptance in our classroom, and sometimes you'll have other students in your class who maybe don't want to work with somebody who has a diverse ability, um, we need to make sure that we can understand that everybody is unique and we all bring unique things. Um, one activity that I do with my, my university students sometimes is to have two students stand back to back and then people have to call out things that are similar about those two people. Each time they call something out, they take a step apart. And then they have to turn around and face each other and they call out everything that is similar about those two people. And then they have to step back together. And they've realized that they're, they're, they're different, but they're also very similar. And it's a, just a really nice activity for them to understand um, that diversity is everywhere in our society. Uh, so exploring those differences in a really safe, nurturing, positive way um, is all about understanding each other, um, moving beyond simple tolerance to embracing that diversity and really understanding everybody brings strengths to a particular setting. Um, I'm going to get you to do an activity now and I'm not going to break you out into your, I'm just going to randomly place you into a, a group. It would just work better that way. Uh, and I want you to have a look at, at what you bring to your particular teaching, to your environment. So this activity is called, what is the tint of your glasses? And as an educator, think about what you bring, what you bring to the classroom. How is your worldview colored by what you've actually experienced yourself? Um, so I've got a, um, a Google slide and you've all got access to that, that particular Google slide. Um, and I want you to, in each of your groups, and you'll just come up group one to 10, place some information on these particular glasses. So your glasses will look like that. And you can see on one side place what your cultural background might be, what your family structure is, and maybe any family traditions. On the right side, place your level of education. So do you have a PhD? Do you have a master's degree? Um, and your experiences with open education. Okay, so I'm going to actually put you in random groups, so don't worry. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter what group you're in. And I, I just want you to have a look at these particular things. So you will need to open up the Google slide and you can type directly into that Google slide. Oh. Fantastic. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed that exercise and it's a, a really a bit about exploring what you bring to the university classroom. So as you can see, you know, we have a wide variety of people with different ethnic backgrounds, um, with some interesting uh, family traditions as well. Um, I had a student once, for example, whose family made shortbread biscuits every morning. That was their family tradition, uh, which was fabulous because they brought them to university and we ate them all. Uh, so some really interesting family traditions that can occur. Uh, my family tradition, uh, every Friday night, my children and my husband, we all sit down and watch a movie together. So everyone has very different family traditions that they bring. Uh, also, you can see on, on the right hand side, we've got people with a wide variety of different learning experiences too. So we've got PhDs in humanities and technology, um, engineering, wildlife ecology, all sorts of different things. So as you can see, if you work through um, all the different groups and what the groups bring, there's such a variety and your own experiences actually determine what you actually um, do within your classroom settings, but also the way you approach different people and different situations as well. So it's important for us to understand as educators where we come from as well and what we bring to that classroom. So thank you to all of the people who have participated and included all of their fantastic information on our Google Slides. So if anybody's uh, very interested, you could go and have a look at those at a later date. I'll leave them up for you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me go back to my other activity. Whoop. Let me share my other screen with you. Okay. So a very interesting activity for us to actually um, do within our classrooms and to make sure that we can, actually, we can bring what we actually bring to our classroom settings and we're all aware of it, okay? I just wanted to touch very briefly on some of the global conventions that Malaysia has been a signatory to and that we really take into account uh, when we're planning for inclusive activities as well. So one of the pivotal pieces of legislation was the Salamanca Statement in 1994 and there was 174 countries uh, involved 
and this was really a pivotal piece of um, wasn't legislation, but a framework for all countries to work collaboratively in providing inclusive education. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is an incredibly strong piece of, of legislation, and Malaysia is a signatory to this. Um, the Inchun Declaration of 2030 was the Asia Pacific region, and countries got together and really determined the priorities uh, that were going to be put in place up until 2030, which really hooked into those UN Sustainable Development Goals. So all of these things really drive what we're doing, um, including some of the legislation or the policy that's come out from UNESCO. In particular, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it was to promote, protect and ensure full and equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms by all people. A really key concept here is inherent dignity of the individual. So what we don't want to do is make a person with a disability or a difference stand out, look different, feel different um, within our classroom. So where possible, we're looking at seamless integration of technology to ensure that open and distance learning is accessible for them. Uh, Malaysia became a signatory of the UNCRPD and is also a um, ratifier of the treaty. So that means that yes, when you're a signatory, yes, I agree to it, that's a great idea. When you ratify it, it means that I'm going to comply with it. Okay. The Incheon Declaration um, was, was, came out of a, a conference in Incheon and talked about education being the main driver of change. So inclusion and equity in and through education is a cornerstone of this particular um, document and really ensuring that teachers are well funded, are trained and uh, qualified and motivated. And this is where these workshops come in. So really making sure that people have the, the knowledge and skills and the desire to incorporate all people. Lifelong learning opportunities um, in all settings and at all levels of education are critical. So as tertiary educators, you guys have a very significant role in supporting um, students in open and distance learning. With the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular for us, Sustainable Development Goal 4, which ensures inclusive and equitable quality education. And once again, promoting that lifelong learning um, aspect as well. Inclusive open education resources do that in a variety of ways, not just through our um, enrolled university courses, but where people can go and access that information as they like, when they like. So that, that sustainable lifelong learning comes into play here as well. In particular, I wanted to point out the, the Malaysia Education Blueprint, um, nearly coming up to, to being revised, but still very much in play. And by 2025, students with physical or learning disabilities are expected to go to schools with facilities and equipment to be able to um, access their learning in a supportive environment at all levels of education. Um, they will be taught by teachers who've received additional training to help them uh, and teaching strategies that are required to address. So in the session we're going to be looking at on Friday, in particular, we're going to be looking at pedagogies that fit in with open and distance learning and inclusive open education resources. Uh, some challenges for educators. These are global challenges, but I, I know from reading the, the Malaysia Education Blueprint that they're also challenges for Malaysia. So things like having a crowded curriculum, making sure that you're accommodating everything you need to. There's very much an international push to raise standards and make sure that everybody can comply with those standards. Global citizenship and the developing of people with a global mindset uh, is something that also came very evident in that document. And um, the lack of preparation to address diverse needs was something that also uh, became evident. So things like um, managing classrooms, curriculum ad adaptation where needed, and being creative in our, our thinking is really important. Uh, in the future, we're going to have increased accountability for all student outcomes. This means that if you have students with disabilities or special needs enrolled in your classes, you're going to be accountable for their learning and for making sure they can access that learning effectively. Uh, there's an increasing need to use and understand technology, and this is coming out quite strongly um, across the world in that we need to make sure we've got digital ready people uh, by incorporating different tools and techniques in our online and distance learning, we can help create those um, digital ready people and provide 21st century learning skills. 
uh, being able to ensure we have global citizens that can think globally means that we need to have diverse populations uh, in our training. And so when we're working with a variety of people, we've got a diverse range of perspectives from across the globe. And we need to be able to teach skills which we may not even be aware of yet. So things are going to be constantly changing. Our technological world is moving so quickly that we may not even be aware of some of the things that we're going to need in the future. Uh, with 21st century skills, it's not always really clearly defined what these are. They're a bit ambiguous sometimes. Um, so some people have made some attempts to really clearly nail down what that means. And things like creativity and, create, and critical thinking are required not just for our students, but for us as le uh, lecturers and educators as well. So we need to be able to be thinking in a really unusual way to make sure that all students can be uh, incorporated. So this is just a graphic of um, some of the 21st century skills that have been articulated. For example, there's the, the basic literacies that are really core that everybody needs to know. So they include those things like literacy and numeracy, um, scientific literacy, ICT literacy, uh, finance and culture and civic aspects. But you've also got some competencies that students need to attain. Things like being collaborative, being able to communicate effectively, um, students being creative and critical problem solvers, and then some character qualities that we want to enhance in our students as well. Things like creativity. Uh, we want students to use an initiative and be persistent when they're working at tasks. I, I'm having some issues with students being persistent. Um, I'm finding that a, a a big problem with some of my classes that that persistence is something that they're not um, very good at. Uh, we need them to be adaptable and, and to, to display leadership qualities and have that social and cultural awareness. So these are some of the very broad 21st century skills that when you hear them talked about, these are the things they're talking about developing. With global citizenship education, uh, it really aims to empower learners to achieve active roles to really face those global challenges. You know, we have challenges across the world. At the moment, uh, one side of my country is in flood. Um, this side of the country is in drought. And those sorts of things will be happening more and more. So we want people to have a global view of things like climate change, education, um, politics, so that we can actually be looking more broadly than just our backyard. Uh, there's a project called the Millennium Project. If I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it, but it looks at future things that might be happening. And it's saying in the future, we need to increase um, internet connect connectivity across all countries. Um, I'm doing some work in Zambia and Gambia at the moment, and that internet connectivity is definitely an issue for them, okay? Um, we also need to make sure that people have some idea of the background of coding. Uh, coding and robotics is, is definitely becoming a, a bigger issue. I'm working with very young children with disabilities in coding with coding robots at the moment. And that's a very exciting thing, but it's something they also need to know. Um, and looking at curriculum design, which involves that self-directed inquiry-based learning. Whoop. So in the future, even now, educators will require three main elements. Uh, professionalism, and that means that you need to understand, have that cognitive ability to understand your content. Um, a personal aspect, you need to be able to build relationships and empathy, a rapport with your students. And you also need those practical things. So the activities, the tools, the tasks that will make that learning concrete for our, our participants. So you need a balance of those things. Open education, and I just wanted to touch on this very briefly at the end, I know that sounds a bit weird, uh, but open education is really a philosophy. And it's a philosophy about how people produce, share and build on knowledge. With our um, access to the internet, with you know the, the global connectivity that we do have, um, it's really important that we actually share that information and don't just hold it to ourselves. So it's a belief that everyone should have access to this to the high quality resources and information that's available. And that collaboration is a key component. So building upon sharing, improving, all of those things really come into open education aspects. There's a number of different um, areas of open education. One of them is open and distance learning. And open and distance learning is um, flexible education opportunities. So it doesn't just reply to online learning, 
It could be paper-based. Uh, it could be CD-based. I, I spoke to people in the Philippines recently and they have radio broadcasts for some of their online and distance learning. Uh, COVID has made us really pivot in regards to what we provide uh, in online and distance activities. So the open and open and distance learning refers to any scheme of educational training that seeks to remove barriers. And when we're looking at um, providing you know, tools and techniques for students with learning disabilities and difficulties, then definitely the removal of those barriers is a key component. Uh, when we look at open education resources, and I'm, I'm going to get into uh, inclusive open education resources on Friday, but I just wanted to touch base on these for now. So they really are any learning teaching research materials that reside in the public domain. So this is things that can be accessible by anybody. As noted by Dr. Fong earlier, they should be licensed. And usually we will use a Creative Commons license. Uh, we're very lucky next week on, on Monday, we're going to have Cable Green, who's the Executive Director of Creative Commons, come in and talk to us about open licensing. Um, so we're really gonna have things that permit no cost access, and that's a really critical one for people living in poverty, for example, uh, that you're able to reuse, repurpose, adapt and redistribute. So it's really very much a sharing element of open resources. With open access, we often forget about this one, but open access is um, provision of free access to peer reviewed scientific um, articles and journals. And you, I'm sure people who are publishing at the moment understand what open access is, uh, and it costs you lots of money to get open access things published. Uh, but in this particular case, it's really making sure that everybody has access to that knowledge. So rather than having to buy a subscription to a journal, it's actually available for everybody. And it, that's a really important component as well. Uh, don't worry about that. So with open and distance learning, um, you'll see here I've got a, a whole list of different journals and all of these journals um, really articulate open and distance learning. So if you haven't had lots of experience in this area, um, you can actually go and have a look. Now, most of these are open and available. There are a few that require a subscription and I've put this particular list up onto your Google site. So if you haven't already had an explore of your Google site, please go and do so. The way I've organised your Google site is that I have um, each session across the top. So I'll put resources for each session up there. I'll put my slides up there for you and any additional information. So that's already available for you to access. OK, uh, what else? And of course, the policy. So this is a very um, important policy and I, I carry it with me everywhere. Can you see that? No, you can't see that. There you go. Um, and this is a pivotal piece of do uh, documentation. So nowhere else in the world is there a national policy on inclusive open education resources. So Malaysia is the forerunner in this area. Um, fantastic. What we're going to do uh, next week, we'll be looking at pedagogy in regards to uh, inclusive open education resources. So we'll be looking a bit about what is IOER and pedagogy that fits with that. We'll also have a guest speaker in from CAST, which is the Centre for Assistive Special Technology, presenting on universal design for learning. So we'll have an absolute expert in the field coming in to present for us in that area. We'll also do have some discussion around assistive technology and where assistive technology fits in regards to open education resources and open and distance learning. So I'll provide you with quite a few different resources that you can access to support students in your classrooms. Um, and then next week, we're going to be looking at uh, ways to actually make sure our content is accessible. So how do we make an accessible PDF form? How do we make an accessible PowerPoint, for example? So we'll be looking at some of those elements there as well. Are there any questions? I wanted to leave a few minutes before I got onto your, your task for some questions. So do I have any questions? Dr. Dayin? Yes. Yeah. The, okay, the copy that you are showing, the cover, uh, yep. this is, there's another updated version. Oh. And the updated version uh, is a published version through the office of uh, Dr. Wan Johannes. It will be uh, uploaded into the website of the Higher Education Department. Perfect. Uh, soon, soon. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. So there is an updated version and a, a published copy, uh, which I, hopefully we can get hold of and put up here as well. That'd be excellent.
Um, so I just wanted to leave a couple of minutes. We haven't got very long. If you do have any questions or comments, please do type them into the chat box. Um, happy to answer any and all questions. And the last thing I wanted to do today, because I knew we probably wouldn't have huge amounts of time, is to look at um, students' needs and barriers and your task. So your task for this week, and it shouldn't take you very long, is to run a little survey with your students. Um, as we said in our little poll, about 50% of people were unsure of the needs of their students. So here is the opportunity to find out. Now, it might just be one particular class that you're looking at. Um, that's fine. So run a little survey, determine what barriers to learning they might experience. And ask the students, do you have any problems experiencing content here? What might that be? So you're actually trying to get a real feel for your students in your particular setting. OK, if you don't have students, um, borrow somebody else's class. So I know that you all work at a university. Um, just ask somebody if you can borrow their class just for five minutes and you can actually work out this information. OK, and then I want you to submit a very, very brief, just written synopsis of what you found. So did your students have any learning challenges? What barriers were they experiencing towards learning? And you can submit that into the folder of the group. Um, and the facilitators in that folder will be able to have a look at that for you. You're not graded on it, so don't worry about that. Uh, but it's just to get you thinking about the students in your classroom. OK. Uh, Dr Fong, is there anything else you would like to... Oh, here we go. ODL practices. Are... Uh, I think it would be very challenging, uh, this particular assignment, because uh, we're in the semester break and oh. probably have no access to our students. What? Okay, uh, well, maybe this one's not an appropriate one. Maybe actually just detail the students that you have worked with previously. Hi, Prof. Uh, hi, Dr. Diane. I would type the groupings uh, on like what institute will be uh, which group. Yep. Uh, because the, the task, maybe uh, the facilitator can brief the the, the each participant of their respective group that would be great uh, briefly uh, yeah so if uh, can we have a brief uh, uh, section for breakout but before that you can yes yes can, yeah absolutely so I'll break you out into your um, university groups and then you can have a, a quick discussion about those tasks now obviously if we haven't got students on campus we can't do that so just pivot that so make it okay what students have you had in the past what challenges did they have what barriers have they experienced okay so we can do it that way uh, I did have a one question from um, current ODL practices with regards to the intention of open learning building on knowledge so open and distance learning in general doesn't necessarily support um, open learning in the way that you're building on practices, but inclusive open education resources definitely does. So with open and distance learning, some of the practices definitely are what we call open, and that way people can access those and can go in, um, but not all of them. So some of those practices are still um, not what we would call an open practice. So distance learning in particular, a lot of that may, may not be open. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think Society 5.0 and, and ODL. Um, interesting concepts. <laughs> I'm not sure if open and distance learning is necessarily the right uh, thing for, for Society 5.0, I think it's more going to be the open and, and um, inclusive, the open education resources, which fit more than, than ODL. So we still do use open and distance learning. And I think that's an important component for us um, to consider. So even if we're not using necessarily um, open resources, we still need to provide education to those. So if we're looking at uh, a society that's balancing the social problems and making sure that we're addressing those social problems, then definitely uh, open and distance learning still fits within that context. So I hope I answered that question effectively. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do now is put you into um, breakout rooms and I'm going to get you to self-assign. So if you can have a look in the chat and uh, just see where um, Dr. Chong has placed your university or your organisation and please go to that particular group. Uh, I got one new message. No worries. Okay, so I shall do that now um, before we, we conclude for the day. So please go into these little breakout groups. Uh, is there any other questions before I go? Yeah, uh, no, okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. I can show you first. <laughs> okay. I can show you first. Okay, is there any deadline? Uh, I, I, I'm asking on behalf oh, of the participants. Yes, yes. yes absolutely. So um, before next Friday, how does that sound? So make it a deadline before you, you come to your next session. And then you're at least coming to the next session with some knowledge and understanding. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dan, uh, my question is about the task. Um, do you have, uh, like, do we need to have, like, uh, estimation students? How many students that we need to do for the survey? Nope, nope, not at all. And if you can't survey students, then that's totally fine. Um, I didn't realise it was your mid-semester break. I'm in the middle of teaching. So, uh, so in that case, you can actually just think back to students you've had previously and what needs they had and what barriers they had. So that would be totally fine. It's really just to get you thinking about the diversities in your classroom setting. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to now put all of the um, rooms up. Please go to the room that Dr. Chong has indicated on the um, chat and um, let me know if you need any help. Okay, so please, if you do have any further questions, um, do not hesitate to contact the facilitators uh, or myself. I'm very happy to, to support where I can. Um, the facilitators are fabulous and they, they have a very good handle on what's required. Um, are there, if there's any further questions, please do put them in the chat as well. But I'm very aware that we're, we're just about over time and that people may have other commitments. So um, Dr. Dr. Chong MC, um, I'll hand back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Diane, for that very interactive session. We will now um, before we end our session, is there any more questions from the participants? I don't see any questions or comments in the chat group. Okay, so just in case you have any more questions, feel free uh, to... I have one question. Just... Yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah okay, I'm we have fine. one. Dr. Tan, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am Tan uh, from UC Malaysia Kelantan. Just now, uh, we have discussed uh, regarding the, the task. Mm -hmm. um, so in our group, we have uh, a few uh, uh, participants. Uh, actually, they are not uh, academician. Mm -hmm. So is it possible we can share the, 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 the groups or, yep. or, 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 yeah, or the survey? Absolutely. Uh, that's totally fine. And you might get those people too, if you're not um, academics or, you know, lecturers, uh, to think about people who you've worked with um, that have diverse needs as well and what barriers they might have experienced during that work time. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be within your classroom. It's really getting you to think more broadly about diversity. So absolutely, they can contribute as well. That's not a problem. Um, but feel free to share as a group. That's absolutely fine. Okay, good question. Dr. Diane. Thank you. Yes, Dr. 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 Diane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the recording for this session will be made available through. I will upload it to the Google, to, okay. session, to session one in the Google folder. So you will always be able to access that as well. There have been quite a number of our participants who were not able to be present today due to other official uh, obligation. Yes, so that's fine. I shall upload that for you. And my notes are also uh, available for you in session one. So you can uh, download those if you wish. And I've put uh, any additional information you need on that Google folder. So uh, anything else I add, um, I'll be adding to that, that document. Uh, and then you can actually download them from there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Diane Schimper. It has been a very enlightening session. Thank you. Dr. Diane, I have a question. Yes. Right. Um, you can be just started our first day of uh, semester today. 
So I'm thinking of sort of like uh, come up with a very simple polling system through our LMS system because the students are going to have an online classes and hybrid. Yes. But I cannot promise how many of them will participate. Uh, can you give me an advice? Uh, what type of uh, polling that will be suitable to you know to to, to you know to get you know certain data from from the students? Sure. What this? what LMS system are you using? Uh, we are using the Moodle base. Uh, okay. So Moodle actually have a polling function. Yeah, but, but what the, what the, the what is the construct that actually we need, we can you know ask the students different type of kind of uh, challenges. Uh, yeah, so I, I would ask I would ask them, um, you know, do you have any additional needs for learning? All right. Okay. And if so, have you experienced any barriers in your learning? What are they? And right, right. yeah, what 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 would work for you to assist you to overcome those barriers? All right, I'll, I'll try to do my best for for that. Yeah. But yeah, email me if you get stuck. I'm very happy to help. All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm quite excited. There's going to be some very interesting results from that task, I think. Uh, so if there's no other questions, uh, I look forward to seeing you on Friday. We've got a fantastic guest speaker and I'm going to, to really talk to you about my area of passion, which is assistive technology. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll all be able to join us on Friday and I, I very much look forward to meeting you again then. Okay, thank you everyone for joining today's workshop on design and development of inclusive open educational resources. We will see everyone on Friday on behalf of Department of Higher Education and our consultant. Thank you once again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, bye. Yeah, bye.